uh, going to be a comprehensive investigation into the Kibnis. It's just a, an interim one. Um, and uh, it's kind of dealing with where I'm at at the minute in terms of all the different competing ideas around the Kibnis. You know, let me see. Okay, so before we get into the Kibnis, it's kind of worth thinking about the background to it. Um, was looking at this uh, earlier today and maybe a little bit yesterday as well. The compass was invented in China during the Han Dynasty between the 2nd century BC and 1st century AD, where it was called the South Governor or South Pointing Fish. The magnetic compass was not at first used for navigation, but for geomancy and fortune telling by the Chinese. In about that period, Chinese people found that lodestones, magnetized iron, suspended so it could turn freely, would always point in the same direction. The Lupan, or geomantic compass, is a Chinese magnetic compass, also known as a Feng Shui compass. It is used by a Feng Shui practitioner to determine the precise direction of a structure, place or item. Lupin contains a lot of information and formulas regarding its functions. The needle points towards the south magnetic pole rather than the north magnetic pole as you typically find in a western compass. In ancient China, the compass was first used for worship, fortune telling and geomancy, the art of aligning buildings. You notice I've highlighted that part. The Jews and Arabs, the Tayaye, both traded with the Chinese via the Silk Road. We can tell that Jews and Arabs applied the principles of geomancy to their buildings. They weren't built randomly, but thought was applied to as to which direction they pointed. And this isn't just for the, you know, the Qibla in the sense of uh, praying towards Mecca, but it, it just in general, it wasn't just isolated to um, the uh, concept of praying to Mecca. It was used more broadly than that, as as the evidence points to. And this, of course, um, confuses things in relation to determining uh, what is a genuine Qibla and what isn't. But still, the direction the buildings point to can actually give us a lot of information as regards what societies thought of as their relationship to maybe other parts of the area. Okay. So this is what one... Lupin looks like like a conventional compass a Lupin is a direction finder however a Lupin differs from a compass in several important ways the most obvious difference is the feng shui formulas embedded in up to 40 concentric rings on the surface this is a metal or sorry this is a metal or wooden plate known as the heaven dial the circular metal or wooden plate typically sits on a wooden base known as the earth plate. The heaven dial rotates freely on the earth plate. Okay. Now, what is the Sanhe? This Lupan was said to have been used in the Tang dynasty from 618 AD to 970 AD. Obviously, that's right smack at the time when Islam is said to have originated. The Sanhe contains three basic 24 direction rings. Each ring relates to a different method and formula. The techniques grouped under the name Three Harmonies are the Sanhe methods. Okay, so why was I talking about that? Well, I, I'm trying to indicate that actually the Qibla idea wasn't new to the Arabs. It, it was being practiced by the Chinese. And Fang Shui is really about alignment of buildings in certain directions. And the easiest way of, of doing that would be to use a compass. Now, um, I am looking into um, how they could have uh, directed, not just in a specific um, direction, like they want to point their building northeast, let's say, but actually to point to a specific location. Um, now, that the, the easy part of that is the latitude, the longitude is the tricky bit. I'm, I'm looking into that. I haven't got a solution. Um, I did discover that there was an ancient Babylonian geometry uh, that used ratios and was really sophisticated. And of course, the more recent uh, trigonometry um, used angles. And it might be that 
they use that mathematical knowledge to uh, work out the longitude using the different angles to the stars and and using the ratios. That's just a hunch I have, but I'm not a mathematician. So if you are a mathematician, perhaps you can leave your thoughts below. Um, all we can say is they seem to know how to align buildings across fast distances. So they must have had some know-how. Um, now, there are some people who say, well, they, they didn't know how to do directions at all. That's one school of thought. I don't think that's really true. There's another school of thought that says, well, they could sort of do it, but they were mostly in error. Um, and that's kind of useful if you want to say that um, there is a Mecca cable when a lot of them are not pointed to Mecca, So, or, or same for Petra. Um, but I don't think that is entirely true. I, I do tend to think that if, if a society is in in a sense saying to the world you know this is what we're really into we can we can do alignments of buildings to far distant lands you kind of think they would be good at it if they if they make that claim or they, they show a kind of passion for that it's not the sort of so, something that you do if you're not really able to do an accurate direction if you, you know what i mean it's kind of like bragging that you can dance when you've got two left feet you know um so i think my hunch is that they could actually do it correctly, but um, we are misinterpreting um, what the alignment of buildings are. And maybe that actually what we thought was a Mecca Kibla might actually have something completely different in mind. Okay. So with that out of the way, um, let's look at this common one, which is what about these parallel Kiblas, which of course is uh, Dan Gibson's um, hypothesis in relation to Kiblis that he couldn't quite match up to the Petra thesis or to Mecca. Um, now, <clears throat> you can find all of his data um, at the website, nabatea.net, as you can see there, um, and you can play around with it. The bit that I find unsatisfactory is the fact that all the place names, with a few exceptions, have been switched off. I don't know why that is. It kind of curtails the viewer to think down certain narrow avenues that Dan Gibson considers important, like Petra or Medina or Mecca, you know, or Jerusalem. Um, it would be more helpful if the place names were there so we could actually see potential other solutions. Um, the other thing is he's gone for uh, a kind of southeasterly direction. Now, with any building, if it has four sides, there are four possible directions and he's gone for one which doesn't seem very satisfactory um and also they're not parallel i know some of them do kind of look a little bit like they are um immediately that suggests to me that whatever about the theory that they're parallel to um a direction going from petra to mecca um if such a direction was known if they had like it's a I just roughly picking a number here uh 260 degrees southeast or something whatever i don't know um some measure then it would be easy as pie for all the build all the people who are building these buildings to go right let's let's use that measure it's 260 degrees and they should all be parallel so there's no reason if they're trying to emulate the direction from Petra to Mecca for them all to have different directions. So that doesn't make sense. It would be actually one of the easiest um, alignments to make if that was what was happening. So I don't buy that. So I think that solution is just false as attractive as it might be for some people. Okay. Um, so the following I'm going to suggest is just a re-examination. The solutions offered are tentative. Uh, big emphasis on that. These, this is not categorical. Um, you may find some of these solutions attractive. You may be convinced by them, but it's, at the same time, this is just preliminary um, and uh, with the view to discussion and to follow up on this later. These solutions directly point at certain locations rather than pass by them. So I'm not um, considering those locations that are like almost there, close to it. No, only the ones that actually do point directly at the location. 
we must try to distinguish intention from coincidence. Sometimes a wall is pointing in a direction, but not on purpose or by purpose. Um, so bear that in mind. The only thing is if, if a direction is pointing with 100% accuracy, the probability is that it was done intentionally rather than by accident, just uh, just by looking at it in terms of probability. But even then, you could be wrong still. So bear that in mind. Now, we must also acknowledge that many of the Petra Kiblis actually miss by a sizable margin. Now, it looks at, you know quite persuasive there when you have lots of lines sort of generally heading in that direction. But it's you notice that the lines cut off at a certain point because um, you're being curtailed to think in a certain way. If those lines continued out, perhaps those lines go to somewhere else that might be the actual real place that they're pointing to. Um, so that's um, something to bear in mind. I'm, I'm not willing to accept that level of impreciseness. Um, I, I think you, the, the lines should at least point to the location. Um, okay um so going to be looking at a few parallel ones or at least the ones that are uh designated parallel kiblis and i'm going to offer other possibilities in with each of these so i think i have three of these and then we'll look at some other kiblis besides those ones so the ribat fortress uh dan gibson concluded it was a parallel kibla Okay, um, so that it is there. It's built 770 AD, if we can trust, you know, the history on that. Um, okay, and it is, what else can we say about it? Okay, I think that's, that's plenty. Let's just go and, um, so why did he consider it parallel? Because he only considered Petra and Jerusalem. He ignored where it was actually pointed into. So what I'm saying here is he concluded it was a parallel Kibla because he only considered Petra and Jerusalem as possibilities. He ignored where it was actually pointed to. Okay. So if you see the fortress there, the inner section, it's not quite square. It's a kind of a funny shape. Um, I've taken a line um, heading north, okay? And what I've found is that it points at Milan. Now, when I say it points at Milan, it's about a mile or two uh, to the east, maybe three or four to the east of this the, the main city centre. Um, it's pretty close. Um, it's not... I wouldn't say it's sufficiently accurate to be reliable, during the 7th and 8th centuries, several Jewish communities existed in northern Italy. Milan had a significant Jewish community during this period. The Jews in Milan were engaged in various economic activities, including trade and money lending. The community had its own synagogue and a cemetery. Um, I didn't find any evidence of a significant Jewish leader, however, living in Milan. So, as I say, I don't think that's a solution. It's possible, but I don't think so. Um, I was kind of excited by it at first, but I, I think it's it's probably not. Um, so let's take another possibility, which is take a line uh, along the southern wall uh, in an easterly direction and just follow it and see where it gets to. Okay. Now, just bear in mind that actually most of uh, of the places that this line will pass through is, is either desert or the sea or, you know, open land. Okay. So it goes across the Mediterranean and you can see it's cutting across Iraq, okay, way down there in the southeast of Iraq, okay. If we get in closer, we can see it actually points exactly at Basra. It's it misses a few, you know, places like the Syria and so forth, okay. Um, that's pretty impressive. Um, I think this definitely is a stronger candidate in terms of its intended direction rather than the Milan one, even though the Milan one looks um, actually quite impressive. This one was spot on, um, really um, incredible. Okay, so the question is why Basra then, if it, you know if this was done there? So we're going to look at some Jewish um, 
history here. Jewish Quarterly Review, volume 18, number one, uh, published in 1927. Um, it says, we essay, however, to put before the readers the history of another Eastern congregation, Basra, which since centuries was closely connected with Baghdad. Already in the responsa of the Geonim, we find references to Basra. Um, so you will have heard of the Geonim, which are the leaders of the Jewish academies. Okay. In the question put before or Moses B. or Jacob Geon of Surah, about the year 830, we read blah, blah, blah in Hebrew. Now, those of you who read Hebrew, and I, I notice, Elan, you're in the in the chat. If you can make out the writing, maybe you could translate what it says for us. That would be really handy, um, but no pressure. If, if you can make it out, um, I wasn't, unfortunately, able to get it translated, um, at least to copy it from the PDF. It didn't seem to work for me. But in any case, that's what it says. So there's a connection between Baghdad and Basra. It's a strong Jewish community there. It goes on to say there must have been a Jewish community in the Basra of the Caliphs and of the Arabian Nights. The city or the community has had famous medical men. About 40 years later, the scholars of Basra turned to the Gaon Nashon ben Zadok about 870 for advice in a question of law. The response reads, and there's uh, a, a response from the uh, Jewish Academy. Okay. Then it goes on to say, we are told Basra contributed yearly 300 gold pieces towards the upkeep of the Academy of Sura. When the Academy of Sura passed through a great crisis and declined considerably, the successor to Or Shead. Dea, Geon, the Geon Joseph uh, ben or Jacob was compelled to leave his place of activities and fled to Basra where he passed away. The next document bears witness to the close connection, financial and social, between the communities of Basra and Baghdad. We see that men of Basra and Baghdad were in close business relations with each other, which led to legal inquiries before the Geon uh, Sharira and his son, hey, you could see really Basra was a prominent Jewish location. Now, what's incredible is you have this um, Qibla that's pointing to Basra. And um, so if we just remind ourselves of what we're talking about here for a moment, right? So we're go back to way back here. Let's get, let's go back to, so we're talking about the Rabat fortress okay um and if we if we look carefully let me just see where yeah and it's in tunisia so we're talking a long distance right to to basra okay you can see there um that would suggest that the community in tunisia there at that location must have been jewish for them to to make a kibla all the way to basra Okay, or at least there's a possibility there. I know there was uh, caliphs and so forth, um, but that seems to be that kind of um, kind of uh, ambiguity between the two groups. Right. Let's move on. So next one um, is Cordoba. Now I know you're probably going to think, oh, well, we can see that it's actually um, aligned. In the direction of Starbucks, but I don't think that Starbucks existed uh, in the early days. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. So where is it pointing to? Right um, now, I'm I'm taking a different Kibla direction to what Dan Gibson has gone for. He's gone for a southerly direction. I've gone for an easterly direction. So let's see where that will get us if we head out along the eastern line there. So we'll go across the Mediterranean, and you see that it's pointing into northern Italy. Um, it's passes very close by Florence, but it it actually connects directly with Remini. Okay. Why Remini? I've no idea. Is there was there some significance of it? Or again, is it just a coincidence? But it pretty much is smack on pointing to Remini there. Um, now if you take it in the opposite direction it is off for seville it's it's close but not quite even though seville is um quite nearby okay so 
we looked at three parallel Kiblas, or so-called parallel Kiblas. Um, there are obviously a lot more. I haven't investigated them all yet. Um, and we'll come back to them at a later time. So let's have a look at some other interesting Kiblas. Fustat, which is a famous one. Okay. Now, um, it's surprising that I don't hear many people talk about this. I'm going to take this direction for the Kibla. Now, I could have gone southeasterly. I could have gone northwesterly. I've gone for this one just to see where it would get us. The reason why I'm not going southwesterly, well, it's kind of just heading into the desert. Um, I don't think there's anything northwest of there from, from what I can tell. So I've gone for this one just to see what what would emerge. Okay. So so it heads off in that direction as you can see across Lebanon and into northern Syria, but it actually is pointing directly to somewhere very significant. Any guesses? Um, it actually points straight smack into Haran, which is associated with the Sadducees and Karaites, which actually uh, matches very closely the views of the writers of the Quran, funny enough. Okay, so that seems like a double whammy of a coincidence, isn't it? Um, and next one is I'm going to kind of remind ourselves I did a video recently on this one, um, Jami Ati in uh, Shiraz. Okay, so I've taken a Qibla along the wall there and followed it and it went all the way across uh, Europe um, and it basically pointed to where the Nazi, which is the Jewish leader, was in Narbonne, France. He had been invited by Charman to set up residence there. Um, so that's another type of Qibla, which is directed at a Jewish leader. Now, at least in some cases, it uh, it was towards wherever the Exilarch was resident, you know, these some of these Kiblis. So if you look at this here from the Talmud, it has been taught, or uh, Shimon ben Yohei said, come and see how beloved are Israel in the sight of God, in that to every place to which they were exiled, the Shekinah went with them. They were exiled to Egypt and the Shekinah was with them. As it says, did I reveal myself unto the house of thy father? when they were in Egypt. They were exiled to Babylon, and the Shekinah was with them. As it says, for your sake, I was sent to Babylon. So the idea is that the Shekinah, which is the, the Spirit of God, is wherever the exile is, in particular the Exilarch, the leader of the Jews. So that might explain the, these various Kiblis. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Here's another one, um, and this comes from one of A.J. Juice's papers. Uh, two, it's called Too Many Kiblas, uh, based on Surah 2. Um, the Damat Suleiman Pasa Mosque and the Academy of Nasibis are aligned to each other. Um, so the one to the west is in what we would call uh, Edessa or Slan, uh, sorry, Shan Li Urfa which I, I believe was probably the original Ur, and it points to um, Nisibis, which is called Nusebin nowadays. Okay. Um, so, according to A.J. Juice, uh, he says, according to Talmudic tradition, the school of Edessa was moved back to Nisibis. This move is attested in one of the central orientations of the mosque Damat Suleiman, Pasha uh, Kami, which points back to this, to Nisibis. It indicates that the religious leadership indeed resided in Nisibis. Okay, very interesting. Um, and there's the line coming out from that mosque, or what is believed to be a mosque now, but probably was an academy originally. So in conclusion, um, I think that there, there's not going to be a simple solution to the whole Kibla question. Um, it's not going to be so simple as to say, well, the real Kibla's were towards Jerusalem. I know we've supported the Jerusalem thesis, but um, 
that is not uh, my expectation. Um, it's probably going to be a case of that there's going to be lots of different Kibla directions um, and they have got lots of different functions. Some of them are pointed to XLARCs, some are pointed to Nazis, some of them are pointed to Jewish academies and 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 many other reasons. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. <laughs> um, I don't buy the parallel uh, Kibla idea that Dan Gibson proposed. I just don't think it works. It's It kind of looks like it could be a winner But it um, it's not really a solution, I would say. Um, now I'm coming back to you all. Then, what is the evidence? Um, I see uh, Peria uh, Peria dot, which is Karen. How is it going? Uh, Margaret three two one. Um, Silver Mubasir. Um, and. Thank you, Karen, for that uh, very nice donation. That's very kind of you. Hello to Damien and hello to Vilnius. Um, so let's have a look. I feel, sorry, I get the feeling Kibla directions are getting more arbitrary. Yeah, um, and it's not <laughs> it's not my intention to kind of make things messier. Um, I'd obviously love a simple solution, but the more we dig into it and go from low resolution to high resolution, we see that actually it's an awful lot messier. Um, now, there's going to be some that won't like that and will prefer a much simpler solution. But history is complicated and um, not everyone was using Kiblas for a strictly religious function like praying in a certain direction. So that's going to muddy the water quite a bit. Um, so that's it. I'm going to keep it reasonably short today thanks a lot for dropping by and uh, again thanks uh, a million karen there for your uh, for that kind donation um i'll see you all very soon thanks for dropping by all the best